Hey everyone, I'm Andy Petronic, the co-founder of the Whole Life Challenge, and welcome to episode 164 of the Breaking Ordinary podcast. This is a show about raising the bar, improving your life, transforming your health, fitness, and well-being, and shattering the status quo. My guests are people who have found the inner strength and confidence to lead from the front, to stand out, to be different, and to truly make a difference in the world of health, fitness, and well-being. Their stories will astound, inspire, and inform, and will help generate ideas that spring you into action. Well, it's uh, really great to be back. Um, It's been a while since I've dropped an episode. I don't know if you guys have noticed, if you're a regular listener, it's been five weeks or so, and um, it's not without good reason, and I'll tell you you about that in a second, Um, but it's the first time I've gone longer than two weeks in about three years, um, you know, this, I've been doing this for a while and it's, so it's odd to me that I haven't dropped a podcast in a while. It's not because I haven't been recording new, uh, interviews with more people. It's because I haven't had the time to focus on getting the podcast complete and recording the introduction because there are some incredibly exciting new things going on at the whole life challenge. And, um, I am back in the role of leader Myself and my partner, Michael Stanwick, are the co-founders of the challenge, and we are now, we're not calling ourselves co-CEOs anymore. We, we did that before, and that led to a lot of stagnation problems at the top. And um, so Michael's got his area. He's the chief of product, and I'm the chief of growth. And we are not co-CEOs. We're co-leaders. And we're we're staying in our lanes and we're doing our thing and it's awesome. It is awesome. And the, the, the shifts we're making, there's some philosophic shifts. Well, the philo- no, they're not philosophic shifts about the whole life challenge. They're philosophic shifts about the way we go about communicating the whole life challenge to the world. Because there are techniques and methods for transforming your life that work better than other ways. And uh, we're committed to making sure that those methods come out in the way we we speak and the way we coach. We also have incredibly cool new programs we're going to be offering. And um, the next challenge starts April 13th. And I, if you've, if you, it's been a while since you've engaged in the whole life challenge, you've got to come back for this one. I mean, this is going to be probably one of the biggest ones we've ever had. And it's going to have a lot of new stuff in it. And I can't really tell you more because it's kind of a secret right now. But the details are coming. They are forthcoming, and I'll tell you as soon as I can. And um, that's all I got to say about that. I want to. I want to get in. I want to introduce my guest because that's the point of this podcast. Um, my guest today is her name is Natalie Dow. It was funny because when I was reading the introduction to the podcast as I do for each episode, I was like, God, Natalie is the epitome of the description. She has created a life for herself where she is influencing thousands, millions of people, but she's doing it in Asia because she is like the queen of fitness in Singapore. And she's renowned. She's known everywhere in Singapore and in Asia. Now, she's Australian, so don't worry. There's no language barrier. And, um, she is, she has created a life for herself as kind of a fitness influencer and fitness celebrity in, in Asia. And, um, the idea behind this podcast was to really just get to know what that's like, get to know her, get to know about her life, how she's created, what she's created, how she, you know, how she trains. She's, um, just a little bit more about her. She's, um, She's represented Asia, competing at multiple Spartan Race World Championships. She's a podium-placed runner. She, uh, she's a Masters Athlete Champion and an age group CrossFit Champion. She regularly appears in... Um, I lost my place in my <laughs> bio. Come on, this is live. I mean, this is live to, to recording. She re- regularly appears in the media across Asia, and she's just a really, really well-known entity. And um, I'm really excited to bring this conversation that I had with her to you guys. I know you're going to get a lot out of this, and I know you're going to enjoy it. So um, without further ado, let's get going, shall we? 
Three, two, one, here we go. Natalie Dow, welcome to the Breaking Ordinary podcast. Thank you. Great to be on it. Um, I, you know, it's. I was saying when we first started, it's so great when everything just works. And by the way, you are. Wait, you're not the farthest. I just did a recording with somebody from Perth. I don't know which is further, Singapore or Perth. You know what? It's about. Uh, it's it's pretty similar. Pretty similar. I was going to say you're you you're either tied with the record or have the record for the longest distance between me and the uh, interviewee. In uh, on my po- on my podcast, so that's awesome, and everything's working perfectly. Yeah, <laughs> love technology. Yeah, it's like you're next door, <laughs> except it's um cold and raining, and the sun's going down here, and it looks like it's sunshiny and bright, and tomorrow there. Uh, yes, and about eighty degrees already at eight a.m. in the morning. Wow, wow. Wait, this isn't summer. This is like that all year round in Singapore, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's winter for us. Um, but yeah, this is, so this is a bit cooler today. This is a bit cooler. Yeah. 80 yeah. degrees. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, um, look, I, you know, I guess probably get to get started. I'd love to know and let, I mean, I don't know that much about you. Um, I'd like to learn more about you and I'd love to know how, like my, one of my first questions is how does somebody like you end up in Singapore? Like, how did that happen? Yeah. It, uh, I mean, you, know, you were born there. My, you were yeah, born there. Yeah, my corporate you? life 15 years ago, I was uh, looking after Asia Pacific region. I was working for a, um IT analyst firm um, and I was up in Asia every month. So it just made sense for me to move here and be based here. Um, so I came with the vision of staying for two years and 15 years later, uh, wow. and a career change, I'm still here. It was, you know, so good I didn't want to leave. So you weren't in the fitness world at all? This, this was not part of your... Thing. No, no. I was healthy and fit um, and running and doing lots of things, but I it wasn't certainly wasn't the career I moved to Asia with. How... So, okay, so you're in, you're in Singapore. You're, you know, you're getting your bearings. You, you like... Like how... When did the change from... What is it you were doing again? What was the, it was a business? So I was running marketing for an IT oh. analyst firm and then okay. media business. Yeah. So you're in that business and you're, are you like, what, how did that happen? How did you suddenly go to fitness? Like why? Yeah. So I, you know, I, I left there, then went to a consulting company and I think, you know, fitness, I'd always grown up being healthy, you know, playing sports from as long as I can remember with my parents uh, playing them as well. So it was very much part of my life. Um, with my job, I would have to travel a lot internationally, you know, so I would be the crazy person getting up at 5 a.m. before a day of meetings started to go for a run, uh, carrying protein bars into meetings to avoid eating the chocolate chip cookies. Um, so... <laughs> It was very, you know, very much part of my life. And then I got to a point where um, I just didn't love my job anymore and decided that I wanted to do something else. Um, Wasn't exactly sure what that was going to be, um, but fell into this uh, by helping a friend lose 60 kilos. Um, That's a lot. Yes. Yeah, which is a lot. Yeah, um, which is more than me. Um, so we started a Facebook group, a private one to help other people, just to encourage people. Um, and that grew to 5,000 people in three months. Wow. Um, wow. So, and it was sort of just friends of friends. Um, so it was like, wow, I think there's there's something going on here and there's an opportunity. So I'd always had my qualifications. You know, I was a PT. I just hadn't trained anyone. Um, So at that point I, you know, went and studied more um, and decided that actually people are looking for content. Um, You know, there's a lot of trainers out there already, so it's not something that I really wanted to do and be a PT full time. Um, I thought I could help more people, which was the idea you know, globally uh, through content and through um, cutting through some of the noise around everything that's published and just, um, you know, providing it in a, in a very short, short way. Well, so did you get into the fitness world because of your personal training and work with your, with people individually, or did you pursue the, 
the the other these other aspects of like you know a fitness first like what was your inroad yeah i think it was a combination of of both really so i still don't train anyone one on one you know i do a um a session for reebok once a week for the reebok community um but i think you know my you know with my marketing background it was more around well how can i take my skill set um from a marketing point of view and a fitness point of view and help people live a, a healthier life um, and reach more people rather than just a one-to-one. Right. And, um, and then, and was that a, did you start with a blog? Like, is that was, it was yes, a Facebook with group? The website. And- so yeah, it was sort of Facebook groups and then built a website or had a, a custom made website, uh, done, hired some writers Um, the website's The Daily Escape. Um, So we very much uh, produce content for corporates, uh, for the government, uh, anything around health and fitness, city guides. So that still continues um, to this day. Um, And then I guess for me it was, you know, starting being a bit more aggressive around social media um, for me personally and built my personal brand that way. So, so it, it, that happened. I was entering some races. I was winning them. Um, so that sort of elevated my profile as well at the same time. What kind of races were you winning? So I was, I was, uh, I got into Spartan racing and obstacle course racing. Oh, cool. Um, so I, you know, they, Singapore sent me over to the world championships two years in a row. Um, and then I was, you know, winning some 10K races and some shorter ones as well, you know, competing in um, CrossFit type of competitions. So I think I was on the radar then for different brands as well, personally. So would you consider yourself more of a business person, a fitness person, a, um, a thought leader? Like where, like where do you put your, cause you seem to, you, you, you're like, do a lot of stuff. Yeah. You do a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like, how do you, yeah. Where, where are you in this whole world? Uh, yeah. So I, I'm getting, you know, I, I, that's not the first time I've been asked that. I like to say a fitness entrepreneur. Okay. And what, yeah. what, what, drives you like are you still excited about competing and being an athlete and showing up and racing and stuff like that or are you more into into seeing people change their lives because of what you're doing or do you like the media and the social media and building the brand and whatnot like what's your thing yeah i think you know i like all of those parts but first and foremost i love seeing people change their lives and being able to directly impact what even one person's life for the better. So I think that's um, the most satisfaction I get out of anything when I get a gorgeous message from someone saying, you don't know me, but, you know, I've changed my life because I've followed you or um, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, I think that that maybe selfishly um, is the, the thing that gives me the most satisfaction, um, you know, but I still still love... Uh, the media work that I do, you know, I think of that as as fun. Um, and, you know, from a com- competition point of view, I think as I get older, you know, I'm turning 47 this year. Um, for me, it's more about the personal challenge around things. So last year I challenged myself to do track, which I'd never done before. Uh, so, you know, trained for a year, competed at that. This year I'm working out what it might be maybe an ultra or something and so for me it's it's more about challenging myself personally and mentally not necessarily you know competing next to the person right and when you compete are you at a are you are you do you com- is it more for fun or are you doing it to like actually win uh, you know, I think there's some that I would be doing to win but then my big challenge of the year I all I do it um as a a personal challenge so i think that's you know if i'm working towards something but i'm not ever going to do something half-assed i'm always going to you know give it 100 percent. and if i'm training for something i'm training you know committed to and i'm not doing it you know off and on well how take me back to like how you 
develop this like you're because you know people don't just suddenly start winning races in their 40s um or thir- even 30s when you were first got got to singapore like where where did you as an athlete come from like how what was that like growing up and yeah yeah no i you know i was a basketball player um so you know always always played team sports not so much running i got into running in my 20s um just more as a as a weight maintenance thing um mm-hmm. and you know i think in your 20s you know you you go in and out of things uh, depends on how much you're partying and and what you're doing but that's something that's stuck and it just became part of my life and i always joke that it's i'm a lazy exerciser like that because you just put on your shoes and you go and you don't have to think about anything um and then you know i think with the the spartan stuff i did it the first one i ever did was just with a friend um and realized that maybe it would could be something i'm okay at um and so i you know then i trained for it and did very well at it so um i think you know as you get older i always say i i think anyone older is more mentally tough um you also you know know how to better manage your time generally so if you're committing your spare time to training it's something you want to do um so i think you know being older physically yes i can get frustrated sometimes uh with performance but i think mentally i'm much tougher than a a 20 year old yeah right right well how um so basketball was your sport growing up Yes, you wouldn't know. I'm not that tall. No, you're not that tall. Like I'm actually <laughs> five, surprised. Five, I've seen, six, yeah. <laughs> I've seen your videos, and like I could see maybe if you played volleyball, you'd be the you'd be this the, the uh, what is it called the setter or the digger, not, yes, the, not yeah. the hitter. So like basketball is like what? How did how yeah, did that how I did know, that happen? Aggressive. I was very aggressive under the basket. <laughs> you were on, you were you weren't even a point guard. You were. Uh, I was I was a guard, but I uh, I would certainly mix it with anyone bigger. That was not a problem. <laughs> wow! Wow! So did that come from like did you do you have brothers and sisters that played basketball? Yeah, so my brother played, my both my parents played. Um so that was, you know, very much I guess the family sport. My dad coached. Um so we were, you know, didn't think twice and and got into that sport. I mean, you know, played tennis, played different things along the way as well, but basketball was the favorite. And um so your dad was a coach. What was that like being coached by your dad? Yeah, good. We're very, we're exactly the same personality pretty much. So there was certainly no favoritism towards his daughter when he was coaching. Yep. Um, but what was, what's it like? I mean, I, you know, the only experience I have of coaching is coaching my son. I never got coached by my dad. Um, was it awkward? Was it hard? Was he a good coach? Was he, uh, I mean, maybe he'll listen to this. Maybe he won't. <laughs> you can say whatever <laughs> you want. Now. Um, no, he was a very fair coach. He was he was a good coach. Um, uh, and I think because he played the sport, so he understood. Um, no, you know, I had, especially as a teenager, you know, it could be your worst nightmare, your father coaching. Yeah, right. You. Right. Um, but no, you know, he took us to national championships and different things. So, um it was actually it was actually okay and, and this was in what city were, what town were you in in australia so i was in perth at this point oh, okay. um and then we moved uh to brisbane shortly after that too which for people that are not familiar with australia that's quite a move that's like new yeah, york yeah so new it's york like to LA. moving la to new york sort of thing you know west coast to, to east coast yeah was that your dad's work took him up took him over yes. there Yes, yeah. And you and your brother, are you guys competitive? Yeah, so my brother, who's three years younger, um, da, you know, his thing is Ironman, he's done Kona, um, finished wow. it in nine hours, I wow. think. So he's an underachiever as yeah, well. Yeah, right, big time. Uh, and that was after two hip replacements. So, wow. um, yeah, we're certainly, uh, yeah, certainly a competitive family. And my, my dad, who's about to turn six, 72 just got his black belt in karate wow you guys you guys have quite the family yeah does your mom do this stuff too my mom uh my mom goes to uh goes to the gym uh and walks so she's the the calmer one out of all of us wow that's that's really amazing 
there's hope for me. I want to start a martial art and I haven't started yet. So um, I'm thinking that, you know, I'm 51, so I could still start. What the heck? What yeah, the heck? You, I mean, my, my nine-year-old does Brazilian jiu-jitsu. My husband does Brazilian jiu-jitsu now. So we always joke that BJJ is a... Uh, uh, man's midlife crisis sport. Oh, interesting. You see all the, the middle-aged guys starting. Oh, really? Huh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have I have more fitness than the average middle-aged guy, so maybe I'll come in. Maybe that'll be advantage, and maybe it won't. I really have no idea. And, oh, I think it will be. I yeah. think it definitely will be. Yeah. I've got a friend who was a uh, kung fu um, master and instructor for years. He lives in Phoenix, and he's uh, he's been trying to convince me. He's like, dude, you got to he, – he, he actually went in and found a kung fu studio near my house. He's so passionate about me doing kung fu that, <laughs> he, that he found the place. He called the guy, had a 30-minute conversation with the, the, with the, head, the head, the sensei, and he's like, I found your place. Dude, I found your place. You got to go in. So I haven't so done it. So kung fu. Yeah. I mean, I think martial arts are great, and I think um, a bit like running, it's a great stress relief. You know, and one thing about a martial art is you need to be present when you're doing it, right? You're not thinking about right. other things. It's almost like skiing down a mountain. You can't be checking your phone. You can't be, you know, off your game. You are, you know, you've got someone on top of you or you're punching something or you're doing something. So it's one of the very few things that you have to be 100% present in. Yeah, right. Well, Natalie, tell me a little bit about your community there in Singapore. Like how... um What's it like? I mean, it's so funny because I, okay, I'll tell you, I got to, I just want, we just watched Crazy Rich Asian, Asians. Oh, okay. And, yes. My, <laughs> friend, literally, uh, my friend is the lead in it. Really? Yeah. Yes. The, the, which one, which the lead? Male. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's fantastic. It's fantastic. I mean, it's a great movie. It's so much fun. And I learned, yeah. it was fun to watch because I learned so much about a culture and a part of the world, assuming it's real. Maybe it's not. Yeah. Maybe maybe that's what people think about the United States when they see movies that are not so real here. Yeah. Uh, like Animal House. Oh, that's the United States. <laughs> or Die Hard. Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. But um um what you know what's 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 life like there and what's what is um yeah. Yeah, so I mean Singapore it's a tiny island but there's you know almost 6 million people on the island. Um I always say it's Asia for beginners or Asia light because it's safe, it's clean, everything works, it's extremely efficient, everyone speaks English. So, you know, it's it's not like you're delving into the deep dark depths of um, mainland China or even Hong Kong. Everything, uh, everything is fantastic. It's multicultural, um, you know, so it's, it's a nice, easy place to live. And I think... Uh, people come like I did for two years and don't leave because it is an easy place to live. And then your access to uh, the rest of Asia is so easy. You know, Indonesian Indonesia's an hour away, Thailand's an hour away, Malaysia you can drive to. So it's, um, yeah, it, it's a nice part of the world to live in. Now, do you spend most of your time on the island? Yes, yeah. So, you know, I think like anything, it's uh, it's always nice to get off. So, you know, with easy access to all these other countries, you know, it, it's to go for a weekend to Thailand is, is a super simple, low-cost thing to do. So, you know, everyone, uh, everyone does that. Everyone travels to race. So if there's a road race on or a Spartan race or whatever it may be, it's it's certainly no big deal to jump on a plane or something to go and do one. And um, so most of the time when you're traveling, you're going to place, you're go by airplane. Like that's a normal. Yes. Yeah. The only place you can drive to is there's a bridge that connects Singapore to Malaysia. And that's, uh, that's the only, the only way you can drive. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's different. That's definitely different. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess it would be a little bit like being on Hawaii, you know, like. Yes. You could... Yeah. And then the, you know, the airport here is amazing. So it, it's not like you're uh, lining up to go through TSA and things. And it's, it's super, super efficient and easy. Right. Right. Um, and then now, did you meet your husband while you were in Singapore? Was that, did that happen there? I met him in Mexico in Cabo. <laughs> Uh huh. <laughs> as you, as you spring, do. So, spring break, like was yeah, it one of those? Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we're from different parts of the world. He's from Wales in the UK, actually. Um, 
lived around the corner from each other in Sydney while he was working down there. We never met. And then we met through some mutual friends in, um, in Cabo and uh, both of us were living in Singapore and we started dating here. And what brought him to Singapore? Like, is he in the same business you're in? Or? His work. So he's in finance. Oh, okay. um, so, yeah, he's, uh, he he's, you know, works here. So we always say this is a great halfway place between Australia and the UK and it keeps, you know, both sets of grandparents equally unhappy that their granddaughter's stuck in the middle. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my gosh. You have one, you have one, uh, you have a daughter? Yes. How yes. Old, how old is she? She's nine. So she, are you coaching her? Are you, are you taking on uh, team team coaches for? No, I'm not sure I would be the best coach, to be honest. I'm better <laughs> off just uh, watching from the sidelines. What do you yeah. think? You'd, what do you think you'd be like as a coach? Why do you say that? Yeah, I think I'm I'm quite an extreme personality, so I think I'm better just uh, just supporting. I think I'd be too tough on her. Oh, really? Yeah. Are you are you tough on her as a mom? Uh, I'm I. I think I'm fair. She, you know, she's a great kid. Um, but I've, you know, we we have a great routine, and she, you know, has boundaries. But you know, I think flourishes because of those. So um, it's not free parenting in our household, but it's, um, you know, we have a good time. That's cool. That's cool. Now, does she travel a lot? Does she? Does she, has she left Singapore? Has she gone to Wales and? And has she been to yeah, the States, she's been, been around to the Australia? World. Oh, wow. Um, I, you know, she travels everywhere with us. So, um, you know, I think pretty, yeah, pretty much she's been to almost every continent at least once. Um, wow. So definitely a well-travelled child. Um, her fate, you know, she loves skiing, which is pretty strange in Singapore since we're not near any snow yeah, but right. it's certainly her favorite holiday of the year and she's way better at it than I am already so where do you guys um, go where do you guys go skiing so we've been to the US a lot skiing uh, that's where she first learned uh, Canada you know we're off to Switzerland at the end of the month but you know Japan would be the closest for us to oh, ski right, right. I-, I have always wanted a snowboard in Japan I heard the powder there is just ridiculous so, it is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, I had a friend post a photo the other day and it, they spent four hours trying to dig out their car from the car park wow. uh, when they came down the mountain. And then they realized after the four hours they'd uh, dug the wrong car out. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, so that's how much had fallen. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, I, I've heard some crazy stories about the amount of snow that falls in, in um, Japan and how amazing the powder is and... Like snow, I mean that's really for snowboarding. That's really the ultimate. I ski and snowboard, but um, skiing. I'm really happy that I can hold my own on like icy slopes. I grew up on the east coast and I ski ice back there. And um, but being out here, you know, when there's powder, strap on the snowboard. Cause yeah, well, like Japan it. would be the place for you, definitely. Yeah. Put it on the list. Yeah, totally. It's on the list. Um, um, tell me so. As you develop your business, as you developed it, when you were first kind of getting into this, was there anything that happened that caused you to say, you know what, this is too much, this is not going to work, I'm going to, I got to, this is just, I'm done. Like, you're going to throw in the towel. Yeah, I, you know, I think um, a lot of times I thought that along the way, um, you know, and, and especially when you've given up a job that is a well-paying job, to mm-hmm. go and do something that isn't well paying or you're doing for free and you're just bleeding cash trying to set it up. So I think definitely along the way, um, you know, I, there's been times where I'm questioning what I'm doing and and is it going to be worth it? Um, and I've certainly learnt patience. Um, I think that that is key. You know, it's, it's everyone... Everyone sees the upside, but they don't see the stuff that goes on behind and the amount of years you've been doing it for. And so I think, um, you know, I found the second half of last year and going into this year, it's, it's, I'm really seeing a, a step change and things are, are really, you know, skyrocketing. But that's been, you know, five years of hard work <laughs> finally, finally coming to fruition, I think. So it's, it's really, just been about having faith and knowing that um, 
you know, you are making inroads and, and you know, things will, will get better. Um, but, you know, I think you've got to measure it not just on financial means, which I've certainly learned. How did you keep yourself going in the times that you were like, this is just too much. Like, what, what did you tell yourself? What did you, what did you do to keep yourself moving forward? Yeah, you know, I think I've got it. I've, you know, especially with the website, I have a team, so it's, you know, I'm responsible for, for their livelihoods as well. Mm-hmm. So I don't make a decision lightly, you know. To, so I guess that it was like I don't, I don't want to close a business irrationally and put those people out of work. Um, so I think that's. That's been the thing. And then when I would have a doubt, you know, pop it out into the universe and something generally happens that gives you a bit of faith Um, or just having a conversation with someone and them and knowing that it's what I've done to impacted them in a positive way is that's all it takes is, you know, some little comment to keep you going. The Breaking Ordinary podcast is brought to you by the Whole Life Challenge. If it's been a while since you've played the game, the next one starts on April 13th. It's brand new. We have stuff going on that we've never released to the public. In fact, we haven't even, we still haven't released it now. It's coming. We're whispering about it now. New things are coming. New programs are coming. I'm incredibly excited about it. So come over and check it out. Go to wholelifechallenge.com and register for the game. I promise it's going to be an experience you'll never forget. Let's get back to the show. How important do you think is that team piece? Like, is that, um, like I found that having people around me that help hold me accountable and give me purpose that's outside of myself is probably one of the most powerful pieces. I mean, it's one of the things that we encourage people to do in the whole life challenge is to have, create purpose that's that's bigger and outside of you. So you have other people, like you said, to re- that rely on you for your for your part, and you have to support them. How how important yeah, has that been for yeah. you? Yeah, super important, I think. And even if it's not, you know, an employee, it's just having you know you're on the hook to someone else, which I think is is important. Even though you know you can sit there and go, oh, I really don't want to do this. I can't be bothered today. I think you know, having to man up and and deliver something or do something, you know, like you said, gives you a purpose for that day just to power through and, and suck it up and get on with it. Do you have days that you that you don't? Like, do you have bad days? Yeah, you know, I think generally if I'm having a bad day, I'll go for a run or go to the gym and that... that um, you know, it gets rid of a lot of frustration for me. So I know how to how to manage uh, myself. I think uh, a lot better than I than I used to. Um, but yeah, you know, not every day is perfect. That's that's for sure. Some days are better than others. And on the days that aren't so great, I you know remember the things that I am thankful for. Where do you spend most of your time in your days? And what do you what do you like? What do you like the most of your what you? Yeah. Do? So. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, everyone sees me on Instagram training and they think I train 24-7 or yeah, right, about right. doing fun stuff, but I, it, that's not the case. You know, I'm in front of my computer for a lot of the day. My training's generally done by, I've done two sessions by 8.30 in the morning and generally I'm, you know, working or at meetings or, or whatever it is for the rest of the day. So, um, When you say you know, you've done two it, sessions, what do you mean? Oh, so normally I run at 5 a.m. in the morning oh. um, every day and then I'm generally at a – I generally follow up with a CrossFit session uh, after that. So I've done two by 8.30. And do you film – Is are those where you get your Instagram content from or, or – Some of them, really? no. And then others, you know, it'll just be if I'm, um, you know, like I said, with the community workouts I do or if I'm doing some other things with – uh, some brands that I work with. So it, it really varies um, around the content. And, and I, you know, I don't pre-plan things. You know, I have a lot of content built up, but it depends upon what's happening, um, depending on what I post. So I don't generally have things lined up a week in advance. If something's happened, then I'll, I'll post how I'm feeling. So just to keep it a bit more genuine and real. 
So your training is two, like two hours every day? Yes. Wow. No days off. Wow. No. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. It, you know, I, it's, I did see a, a funny meme the other day talking about, you know, it's harder to have a day off than it is harder to train once you, uh, you know, have a rest day. But I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not going 100% in my runs all the time, you know, so I, I will have an easier run day, which I like to say is active recovery or something. So yeah, it's right. not not like I'm training at 100% the whole time. And when you when you have a hard run, are you at the track? Are you doing intervals? Are you like what's... Generally the... intervals or hills or something, yeah. And then easy days are like long, slow distance? Yes, yeah, yeah. And then your CrossFit workouts are... Are I'm just doing, going are you to doing Fran? And doing. You're, are you doing Fran yeah. every day? Yeah, I, I love it because I turn up and I don't have to think what I need oh, right. to do. Right. Um, and then I will go to the gym and do accessory work myself and different things that maybe um, maybe I need to do um, as well just to, you know, core and, and different muscle groups that maybe I'm not working so much in CrossFit. Have you ever considered that, like two hours a day every single day is too much like do you ever wonder if you would get better gains by not training some i i'm just curious because i that's all yeah, that seems like you a know, lot and me. i yeah and i um you know on holidays i will go to the gym but i obviously won't be training two hours a day but right. i think for me i look at it and it's such a small percentage of my whole day mm-hmm. um that you know it's i don't you know, and when you're saying two hours, well, you know what a CrossFit class is like. You're not going crazy for an hour. Right. Um, right. So I think because it's cross training, um, then I'm sort of, it balances out. And I'm not a, you know, I'm certainly never going to the CrossFit games. I'm not that type of CrossFit athlete. So I think as I'm older, I know how to better manage my myself and my body as well. So, mm. you know, if I'm tired, I'm not going heavy. You know, there is no ego around lifting heavy weights for me. So I right. I know when to push my body and when not to. Yeah, that's good. I think that's important when you're, um, especially when you're training so much. And yeah, t- removing that those expectations. You know, I think it's one of the things that people get stuck with. Like, well, yesterday I was able to touch my palms to the floor when I stretched. Shouldn't I be able to do that today? You know, like they, they go in with these expectations that their body doesn't change or there's not good or bad days. And I think it's really important when you go to pick up a, you know, a barbell off the ground or you go in to do a yoga class that you are respectful of what, what you're experiencing that day. And agree. And that's why from a running point of view, I heart rate train with my running. So, oh, cool. you, know, you know, if you're having, if you're starting to feel sick or you're having a bad day and your heart rate's through the roof, then I'll run a lot slower than I normally do so um i think it's it's really being in in tune rather than feeling like i need to go out and run fast and be panting at the end you know if if my heart's not letting me do it that day it's not letting me do it that day so it's leaving your ego at the door and being able to do that do you stay in a certain zone like for your long long yeah i do i you know i always try and stay sort of you know 80 percent of my training's done in a steady heart rate zone you know like what percentage of your max heart rate do you stand so so my generally my steady is between 134 and 149 okay um and your max so, is like 180 190 something like yeah that. so if i'm running really hard it's above 166 will be my top yeah okay. so okay. um you know so i'm i'm pacing it consistently at that which you know, I can have a conversation and keep running for as long as I want at that. Right. Um, and I don't even need to look at my heart rate because I know how I'm feeling pretty much at that. Yeah. And do you um, do you have any sp- specific style that you do of running? Like, are you a barefoot runner? Do you have specific, um, Do you, have you ever done any, done any work on mechanics? Um, you know, I, touch wood, I've, I haven't had any knee injuries or running injuries ever for the amount that I run. So I don't think I'm a pretty runner. I, I feel, <laughs> you know, I, I, when I started doing track, it was interesting because I've never been more injured in my life. Um, huh. You know, I did a hamstring. I 
did a calf and that was all because I, as soon as I put spikes on uh, and went explosive, um, right. I, you know, changed the mechanics completely of how I ran um, and especially going into track not knowing what distance I would be decent at as well or should train for. So it was very much experimenting around that. Um, so I think, you know, maybe it's an age thing and, and because I don't have the technique uh, of sprinting across all those years of, you know, when people have done it at school or college, mm-hmm. um, you know, I had to be super, super careful. And even now if I put the spikes on, I'll, I'll get some plantar fasciitis or something too. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. I wonder if that's because you transitioned from running you know, in normal running shoes, you land in your heels to sprinting with spikes. You're landing definitely. on your toes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And do you continue doing track workouts now or do you? Not as not much. So much. No, you know, I'll go and do some 400 sets or something, but I, um, you know, I haven't, haven't done so for a while. I was just getting so frustrated getting injured and it was stopping me then from doing all my other training. Yeah, right. Have you ever had injuries in any of the other sports you've done? Like in the CrossFit or barbells or dumbbells or kettlebells? Touch wood, no. And I don't think I lift heavy enough to have a huge amount of, um, of, you know, everyone does their shoulders and does different things. So I think, you know, I my whole, um, you know, thing is I'm not, I'm not going to lift heavy enough to injure myself so then I can't go for a run the next day. Right, right. So you, you, um, you train hard but you train hard with the intention of living to fight another day. Yes. Yeah. You're not so, you know, give me a, give me a ward and I will smash any, any ward, no problem in the gym. But when it's the weightlifting portion, I will always tread much more carefully. Right. Right. And so, well, since we're on the topic of your fitness and your kind of your routine, what, how do you work your way through your day? Like how does, if you're training first thing in the morning, like do you take your daughter to school? Do you like, how do you negotiate all that stuff? So up at five, um, my husband runs with me most days as well at five. Um, And then I'm home. I get her up ready for school, um, get her breakfast, get her on the school bus, and then I'll go to CrossFit. Um, Uh, So you have like a little break between the run and, when you go yes, to the gym. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So there's sort of an hour break in there. And then um, you know, I I intermittent fast, so I I have I wouldn't have eaten or had coffee or anything until about nine o'clock. Um so I'm sort of I'm doing both those sessions fasted from the day before. How do you how do you like that? Yeah, I I I mean I think I'm so used to it now that um it I I can't exercise and eat. Anyway, um, and I feel like my energy levels are fine. So I generally stop eating about four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, wow. Yeah, so I'm I'm okay. I think your body gets used to it. And now if I eat later, I feel heavier. Um, yeah, so it's not so bad. So no family dinner. There's no family dinner. At no, your so she. I won't do that to my nine year old. Obviously, <laughs> um, right, she right. eats. And I'll, you know, sit with her for dinner. Um, but my husband follows the same thing as well. So for us, you know, we joke we're super boring. Not that we won't ever go out for dinner if there's, you know, dinner with friends or something. Of course, we'll break it. But, you know, 90, 90 95% of the time we're, we're following that. So you're, when you go out for dinner, does your daughter just eat by herself? Like how? I'm, I'm just kidding. Oh, no, I'm well, totally well, kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, we're not ordering just water for us. Um, at home, she'll, you know, at home I'll sit with her while she eats yeah, um, yeah. so she's not, you know, going solo. Uh, but if we're out at dinner with them, you know, with friends or with her or whatever, we generally do lunches more anyway. Um, right. But if we're at dinner, yeah, of course we'll eat. And do you guys eat together at lunch? Uh, Weekends, yes. Weekends, breakfast is our biggest meal. So we oh. always go out for breakfast every weekend. That's our family, um, uh, you know, our family time before the day gets so crazy. So we'll go and, you know, treat ourselves um, to our favorite cafe for breakfast but every not, weekend. But not before nine? Uh, no, some depends on what activities are on, but generally between eight and nine, yeah. Okay, okay. And then so... Uh, so the rest of your day, you drop your daughter off, you go to CrossFit, you come back, 
you get to the office. Do you have a shower in your office? Like, do you, are you oh, guys I connected? Work from home. Oh, nice. Nice. Yes. So yes, you have a shower at the office. <laughs> yes, I have, I have a couple of showers at the office. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you're, are you tied to your computer the rest of the day? Like how? Yeah, how I'm sort work? of in and out. I'll have, you know, I, I'll have meetings sometimes. So I might be back out to, you know, to catch up for, di- you know, with different people um, or to shoot something or whatever it may be. And then I'm home um, around, you know, four o'clock for her to get home from school. Um, generally, we'll uh, take her to activities. We'll ha- we have a nanny as well. So um, there's someone, uh, which is the usual thing to do in Singapore. Um, so there is someone sort of helping uh, around the house as well. Oh, that's nice. Um, and then when, what is your, do you have an evening routine that you guys like employ? We're in bed by 9.30 generally because right. we're up at five. So, um, you know, it's, it's, we're, we've got a, we have a busy life and a busy week. So, you know, she's out at activities after school generally. Um, you know, my husband will do BJJ after work. So, it's literally, you know, everyone's home. Uh, she's in bed asleep at eight, and then we're asleep by nine thirty. So it's it's not a lot of Netflix time on the couch. Yeah, you guys. Uh, and you generally, guys I'll sort of around. sort yeah. plan some things for tomorrow on the computer before we go to bed. So I really shouldn't ask you too much about your Netflix list because you're not really. Oh watching. no, I love Netflix. Don't get me wrong. Oh I really? Just started watching not during you. The, not during the week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm always up for a good series, definitely. What did, what did you say you're watching? What's your you, you? Why are you? Um, I haven't heard. Very that. good, bit of a thriller. Yeah, oh, yeah, just started, just started on that. It's a new one, I think. So funny. I've watched so much TV over the years, um, but about six months ago, I just was like, God, I am. I am like watching my TV. I'm I'm like spending my life, my free time watching, just watching mindless television. And I just stopped and uh, I kind of miss it. Like there's some shows, like I can't wait for Game of Thrones. The last season is going to start yes. soon in the spring. Um, I'm looking forward to watching that. So I'm, I'll, I'll get back to some TV watching. There's, yeah. And I think some, you know, it's a good release, but we certainly don't turn the television on every night. It just depends what's, yeah, what's happened. Yeah, yeah. totally, totally. I know you guys know this already, but the podcast lives and breathes based on your word of mouth and your recommendations and reviews in iTunes. If you enjoy this episode, leave a review. The easiest way to do that is to go to bit.ly forward slash breaking ordinary, bit.ly forward slash breaking ordinary. It will open up iTunes and you can write a review. If you're super motivated and you really, you know, you want to share, spread the word, post the link up on Facebook. Spread the word on Twitter. By you doing that, you help propagate the the message that we're trying to transmit to the rest of the world about health, fitness, and well-being, and you're doing your part, and we really appreciate that. That's all I got. Let's get back to the show. I was going to ask you, your husband then stops eating at four? Does he stop eating at four too? And then he, then he trains, comes home, yeah. no food still, goes to bed, gets up, runs, no food still. Yeah. Right? How is that? That seems yeah. that seems like a bit crazy. Yeah, I mean I think he um yeah, you know, it work I think intermittent fasting works for males much better than females just because of hormone levels mm-hmm. with with females, but yeah, he's um yeah, he's used to it now. You know, he'll eat a couple of times during the day and eat just before 4. So he's he, you know, he's he's ready to go for his training at 6.30 or whatever. Um, but, yeah, I think we've been doing it a couple of years now, so it's it's just like anything. It's like habit um, and feel much better for it, definitely. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. I, I, I've experimented with it, and I've been more strict at times than others, but right now, like, I'll have coffee in the morning. I'll, I'll be generally fasting from about 8 p.m., and then I'll have a cup of coffee or two in the morning. And sometimes I could put coconut oil in my coffee without counting it against my fast. I don't know if that counts or not, but 
Um, yes, it counts. It counts. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not fasting. I'm not. Never mind. I'm not fasting at all. No, but you know, and I, and I always say to people, it you know, well, it's meant to be anything that triggers a metabolic reaction. So coffee right. counts. You know, it's only meant to be water. Uh, but it's like each to their own. I'm certainly with eating. Um, I'm I'm a big believer in not one size fits all, and everyone yeah. is completely different. So for me, I. I fast, I, um, you know, follow a bit of the RP uh, methodology, which is, you know, balance, you know, counting your macros and knowing what macros work for mm-hmm. you the most. So, you know, people are like, do you eat carbs? And it's like, of course I eat carbs. I eat carbs every day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for me, it's it's cutting down on fats, which works. Um so it's yeah. I, I think when people, you know, nothing's really changed in diet over the last fifty years. It's just people are putting these things in boxes and calling them different things. It's yeah, I mean, eat whole foods, yeah, eat good foods, yep. and don't eat too much. <laughs> and, and experiment with with macros, which is basically yes, what all these absolutely. different that's all these different diets do. I mean, they're just yeah. experiments. You've got forty, thirty, thirty. You've got uh, Adkins, which is like ninety, ten. Um, and you've got keto, which is like maybe, you know, 70, 20, 10. And, um, um, but they're just experiments, you know, and absolutely, there's no such thing as one size fits all. I don't believe. No. And I think you got to find something that's sustainable. So it, for me, it's not a diet. It's how I live my life. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's what it has to be. Not, oh, I need a new resolution. I'm going on a diet. No, just change how you, how you eat. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I, I, I always struggle with the word diet. Like, I really don't like writing it. I hate it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and But yet, I don't have a good substitute, like, because it's so convenient. People understand what you mean when you say, that's not in my diet. It's not, or, yeah. as opposed to saying, that's just not the way I eat. Like, that seems yeah. weird. That seems weird, you know? It is. And I always say, you know, do you follow an eating, any type of eating plan or... You know, because most people still don't know what a macro is. Right. Um, right. So, yeah, I think, like you said, diet's the easy down and dirty way to, you know, that people can relate to. Yeah, right. Right. Um, if, if you think, as you think about your life and the, the meaningful people around your life, who are some of the people that have had the most profound of an impact on you, like yeah, recently or a long time ago? Yeah, Definitely my parents, I think, obviously, because, um, you know, being, you know, well, I guess instilling a healthy lifestyle into me growing up um, and, you know, still continuing to live their lives that way, um, I think have, have definitely, you know, had an impact. And then, you know, I have to say, um, my daughter as well, you know, you've now you're responsible for a little person who looks after you and who's constantly saying, I want to be like you when I grow up. Um, you know, I think, you know, her more than anyone uh, keeps me honest and on the hook. Did your, is, is having a, a child something you've always wanted? No. You know, it was not, I wasn't one of these people that that was my life's, you know, mission. It was if it happened, it happened. Uh Um, And it did. And obviously it was the best thing that ever happened. Um, But it wasn't, you know, it it was never going to be about, you know, 2.5 kids and a white picket fence for me. Right. Right. Um, And what, and how did it change? How did life change for you? Like what, what changed? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, as soon as I had a child, I mortality, my own mortality was brought to the forefront. You know, you get on a plane before and you don't really care. And now I get on a plane and think, oh, my God, what if I die? <laughs> you know, Isn't that weird? So, that is weird. Yeah. That same, yeah, exact same question for me. In fact, some of the racing and crazy stuff I used to do, I just don't do anymore. Like, I'm like, uh, yeah. I don't I don't need to go do that. Like, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, yeah, it's weird though, right? You know, and I don't think unless you've had a child, can you explain that to someone? And yeah. it's it's obviously at the very uh, core of it, you know, to protect your this thing that you've you know uh, given birth to. So I think it's it's almost maybe caveman like stuff. 
Um, so I think that, you know, that certainly uh, changed everything for me. And then just, you know, she makes me want to be a better person every day. Mm-hmm. Um, how how is that been with you and your husband, like in terms of the the parenting and how how have you guys meshed your styles of, you know, there's always stuff always fun dad there's yeah. always fun dad and and mean mum um, <laughs> <no, laughs> always um no I think we're but we're both very consistent and so I think for us consistency is the key um when raising her so um you know we both it's nice he does jujitsu with her you know I do different I, I take her to athletics and we do different things together so I think uh, I always, you know, we're a really tight family unit. Um, you know, for us having a child, the joy of it is being able to watch her play sport or do whatever, sing or do whatever she chooses to do. So we make sure we're present um, to do all of those things too. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think that's that's the nice combo. I think we've we've got it well, but consistency definitely the key. Yeah, no, that, I mean, I think that really helps kids, um, knowing what they're, knowing what to expect. Yes. What, they might not like it, but they know what they're going to get when they walk in the door and when they come home or when they talk to your, talk to your parents. I think consistency is such an important piece. And they, and I think it, you know, it gives them room to explore who they are, but, you know, no, you know, I'm always pushing her to, you know, take a risk and not be scared to take a risk. But, you know, there is someone who's got her back at the end of the day as well. So I think it's a really fine line of empowering kids to get out of their comfort zones and try something. Um, And I'm also always very wary of not putting my fears onto her. So, you know, they say when a kid says they're on a swing and they push me higher and higher and you're thinking, oh, my God, they might fall off, they're going to break their arm, they're going to do something. It was, It's like you know what, if that's what you want, go for it. She broke her arm on the monkey bars and had to, you know, have it reset and, you know, twice and different things. But then she was like, I want to get back on the monkey bars. It's like, you go for it. So I think that's the important thing. Yeah, no, I think there's a tendency to, um, well, I mean, it's been written about a lot, but hovering and helicoptering and, um, you know, trying to prevent your kid from every not anything ever happening to them, like wrapping them in bubble wrap and, and uh, sending them out the door. And it just doesn't like the world teaches us based on our experiences of things that don't work. And we have to experience them in order to learn like it. it there's no other way to do it. You know, like, yeah, our- absolutely. And I think, you know, kids don't learn from you telling something they learn from actions or experience. Yeah. And so, if there's a bit of adversity, that's a good thing. If it's a challenge, that's a good thing. You know, we, uh, you know, do a bit of tough love in our house as well. And yeah. it's like, you know, that's that's life. You want you want to raise children that are ready for life uh, and right. to be good people. Um, and so I think that's that's super important. Well, if they've never had a chance to work things out for themselves, hold on a second. You know, I've got all my everything on silent except my watch. So my, my (laughs) watch, my watch is ringing. I've got to um, say move, move or (laughs) no, but it's a phone call. It came in, but everything is silenced except my watch is ringing. So hold on. Let me, let me put that on. God, there are too many damn things I'm connected with. (laughs) Um, God, what was I going to say? We were talking about kids. We were talking about, oh, resilience. I mean, like kids have to learn how to work things out on their own. And, and you know, a great way to do that is to let them work things out on their own and learn the lessons that it, that, it, that are going to be required later on in life when they don't have you. But if, that's but, right. But you can't, you can't, you can't do it all, all they're thinking for them, you know, like, cause then they don't, they don't develop the skill of being able to make decisions and, learn themselves and problem solve too yeah. right yeah. you know they've got to be able to uh to do that and you know you they're not going to be confident enough if you don't empower them to do that either yeah right um well on that same topic of risk taking you know 
it it appears to me that you've really got everything figured out. Like, I mean, in a really good way. No, I mean, I'm I'm being serious. Like, you've got it going on, and I, and that may or may not be true. Like, I don't really know because I don't really know you. I know you through this Zoom link, and I'm watching you and talking to you for 45 minutes. But, but what are some of the things that you may not be? like the, where you struggle or you have to take risks or you're doing things that are, make you uncomfortable that, that you're learning and growing from. Yeah. You know, I think it's, um, you know, putting yourself out there is always, uh, an, un- you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily, you wouldn't think so with social media, but I'm quite a private person that, you know, is quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't eat at night. So there we go. I'm not out partying. Right, um, right. Yeah. So I think for me, you know, that's, a, that's always a risk is, is bearing some of your soul out there and, you know, um, and taking a risk to put yourself out there. Um, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, it, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful just because you're posting or because you're doing something. But I, I like to be genuine and I like to tell a story and I, um, I like to tell people who I am. So I think that's, you know, a risk every day is, is letting people into my world, my personal world. It's, it's certainly, you look at my Instagram feed and it's not beautifully taken photos uh, with different filters on. It's most of the time my nine-year-old taking them for me. <laughs> um, so, uh-huh. so I think doing that and, and you know, I'm not, I'm not a 20-something out there. I'm, you know, a late 40s-something out there doing it. So I think it's, it's sometimes having doubt going, am I too old to be doing this? You know, um, you know, should I be doing this? Should I just be going to get a job? So, you know, having self doubts around that type of thing always. Is there anything that has stopped you? Like where you, like, do you have a coach or do you work with anybody to help you push through things that are, that, that are getting you stuck? No, I generally, you know, my husband has, even though he's, he's not ever practiced, he's got a psychology degree. So when I need to talk to someone, we generally go for a very long walk at night, <laughs> um, sometimes over multiple nights uh-huh. um, to talk to talk it out. But no, I don't. So I, you know, I'm pretty good at sticking to plans and, and going, you know, going with my vision. So I, I just suck it up and power through um and you know i think everyone lacks some sort of self-confidence at at some point when you say you're good at following your plans do you make do you spend a lot of time planning yeah i have i have lots of lists and um whiteboards full of stuff um so i'm you know i'm old school like to write things down and i'm extremely organized i do you know like like a bit of structure um so yeah i definitely you know need that to keep me on track well well, what kind of tools do you use to keep yourself so organized like do you just have a notebook you write everything down in do you have a place online that you keep it like what do you how do you yeah i have a notebook i write my list for every day the night before um and i have a whiteboard that i write uh, everything on that I need to do, which is a uh, a combination of, you know, work things. It's got my heart rate training up there. It's got, um, you know, goals up there. So, a, um, you know, a real variety of, of things that keeps me going. Do you transfer stuff um, from the whiteboard? Like, do you take pictures of it or do you write it down somewhere else to keep it for longer term? Because whiteboards get erased, right? Yeah. Um, no, I don't generally. I sort of, I'm a tick the box and off I go. I do, and you might find this random, but um, from a, a goal setting, setting point of view, every month I do write a list and I physically write it down um, of things that I would like to see happen in my life. So longer term goals um, and things that I don't want in my life as well. So I put those, I write those every month, I revisit them and I put them in the drawer for the month. 
Oh wow! And you don't look him in a, look at him again until the beginning of the next month. Yeah. <clears throat> so you you're confident that you're you'll stay on track with those things in spite of not looking at them. Yeah, I think and you know my thing is put it out to the universe and and see what happens. And it's not things like win the lottery, although that would be nice. But it's you know it's things within uh, that you think could possibly happen or you you know, no, we're getting closer to happening um, or some, you know, some, you know, brands that I want to work with or some personal stuff. So I do that every month. And are you normally surprised by how many things have happened that are on that list? Yeah. And it's, it's an interesting thing because sometimes I won't look at it every month. I'll just do another one and pop it away. Huh. Um, but yeah, you look back and then I think it's a, a great time to self-reflect of, wow, all this stuff did happen that I wished for or that I worked towards. So it's, um, you know, or you skew them slightly different because it maybe things have changed and what you, a goal you'd set needs to, to you know, be reset or have different numbers around it. Um, so it is really satisfying looking at looking at it. Do you set aside a time like in your calendar on... February first, you're gonna you're gonna do this. You're gonna look at your stuff and take those out of every the full and, moon. Oh, every full moon. How, really? Yep. Is that it? Is it just? I mean, like, what's the significance of that? Is it just a thing for you? Yeah, it's well, it's that's my mum. My mum, um, you know, actually put me onto it. Um, yeah, that's when you're meant to, you know, do your wish list every full moon. Huh. So. Yeah, so that's when I generally do it. So then I remember, um, you know. So it's it should be around those cycles. Do you do you actually calendar it and put it down and make an appointment with yourself to do it, or like how do you organize that stuff? No, so I know. Like I, I mean, um, from a full moon point of view, I mean, number one, I can see it when I'm running, so I know it's time to do it in the mornings. <laughs> the sun hasn't come up, so. Yeah, right. Um, you, uh, you, you know, I generally can tell when it's, when it's time. Well, yeah, but if you, but if you have something like some big photo shoot or some big thing that you can't do it that day, like, what do you, do you just make sure you get to it the next day? I'll generally come back and do it first thing and just, and get it done or do it the, the day after. It doesn't have to be on the exact day. You know, it might be the day before or after, but, um, yeah, generally, you know, I'll, I'll make time to do that. It doesn't take long. It's five minutes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, yes, I, I get that. There's a lot of things that I know that people resist that are, that have to do with kind of recurring events or planning that a lot of people just don't want to do that don't take that long, but they build it up in their minds. I well, I keep saying they, I do this. I build <laughs> things up in my mind. Like, like, um, you know, I may not do that if I didn't actually schedule the time in my calendar to do it. And, um, I'm just curious, but that's really, that's a really cool thing. Cause the nature kind of tells you when it's time. Yes. Yeah. So I think that whole, you know, the, 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 you know, it's very old school, but I, yeah, I, I think it's a good thing. And, and I think it's important to put the things down that you don't want in your life too, because instead of just wanting and wanting, sometimes you got to take some things out that, Shouldn't what kind of things there. make it on your list of not wanting? Like your husband, people, your husband never makes people. it on there, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah sometimes people. Uh, yeah, sometimes people or sometimes things that I'm doing that I'm spending time on that really I'm not doing for the right reasons or I've been talked into and I, oh. um, you know, it's not a good use of my time and I want out. So, um those type of things. I'm, I'm pretty good at saying, I, we always joke in our house that we always default to no, you know, people aren't very good at saying no. no I'm extremely not. good at saying no mm. uh, because I always think you can come back with a yes, but you can never, it's harder to. It's hard to go the other way, no. right? Once you've said yes, it's so hard to get out of it. That's right. But if you say no, there's always a chance that you can say yes later. Yeah. Like, oh, oh my schedule freed up. I can have lunch. Yes. Correct. As, a, as yeah. opposed to you got to make up some excuse why you can't go if you've, yeah, that's it. That's cool. That's a really cool way of thinking about it. I never really thought yeah. about that before. Which is, it goes against everything, you know, the, the yes man books and everything. But um, yeah, generally a, a 
default to no if I'm not sure um, is always the thing. Because I, I won't lie. I'll, if I don't want to go to something, I'll just tell people I don't want to go to it. You know, yeah, right. I'm bigger, uh, you know, 47. If I can't say what I think, then, you know, I'm never going to be able to. Totally. Right. Yeah. It's, and it's good that you know, you know, you have a, you, you seem to have a certainty about you that you can kind of ask yourself, because you, I, I think a lot of, a lot of times people don't necessarily know, like, do I like this? I don't know. I go. If like, I, I, I heard, um, God, what's his name? Uh, he was a music, he was a music guy and, um, he wrote a blog post about, about if it's not a hell yes, it's a no for him. Yeah. I it's love gotta that. Be a, it's gotta yeah. be a hell yes. And if it's not, if it's like, ah, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I guess I could go like, no, that's a no. So, uh, yeah. So that's good. That's yeah. I, I'm a true believer in, in that. I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a good way to live. And, and it also makes you think about how you're valuing where you spend your time as well. So, you know, of course you do things that you don't necessarily always want to do, but you're doing them because you're doing it for a friend or you're doing it for a, a, a different reason. Um, but, you know, you, your time is limited and that's the most precious thing you have. So if you're doing stuff you don't really want to do or be at, then don't do it. Yeah, right. Well, um, and so, okay, so we haven't talked much about you being a brand ambassador or you know, some of the bigger things you've got going on. What are some of those things that you've got going on and what, and how do they serve, how do they serve you and how do they serve the world? Yeah. So I think, you know, back to what we start, started talking about right at the beginning, um, my vision was always to reach more people, not to be training people one-to-one. So um, as part of that, I launched um yet another fitness app into the market, you know, (laughs) Uh (laughs) just for something different. Um, You know, and and I I obviously know there's a lot out there, but there was no one, you know, I don't think there's anyone in Asia that still launched one, to be honest. Um, So I I did that last year. Um, What is, tell me about your app. I don't know. I don't know about your app. What does it do? Yeah. So it's, it's called Rockstar Fit. Uh, iTunes store and Google Play store. Um, And my whole ethos, again, with what I truly believe is is helping anyone, you know, get fit or healthy no matter uh, what their background is, you know, where they live, uh, their income level. So there's a lot of, instead of having to pay for it, there's a lot of free workouts people can do on there um, with no obligation. So... Um, and there's family ones and there's, you know, travel ones. There's all sorts of different different ones on there. So I launched this thinking my market would be the over 40s because I'm over 40, mm-hmm. um, but it's not. It's uh, surprisingly all ages, which is great. Um, and now I'm in a version two build at the moment Um with things like community meetups so people can actually connect and work out together oh, cool. via the app um, and score points and different things. So, again, um, you know, some of the programs are paid for, some are free, but just to get to get people moving was the whole idea. Is it more um, – has it been more downloaded in Singapore or – I mean, does – is there any Actually, reference US to has done, US has done extremely well. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, yeah, no, how so would you I know? Think, you wouldn't know if I went to the app store, I wouldn't know that you're in Singapore, right? No, you wouldn't. Absolutely. Right. You wouldn't. Right. So um, it's done well. Yeah. It's done well in, you know, across the world, Australia, it's done well. Um, so a lot of, a lot of um, countries that obviously the market's quite saturated, um, but it still seems to be performing okay. And of course, you know, it's, it's done well in Asia and India is an interesting market too. Now, are you providing content for that by like, are you doing videos in, in that or the workouts? Yes. Is it, oh, it is. There's all videos. Yep. Yep. It's all video based. Yeah. And it's all you doing, you're yes, in the, you're the star me. of the videos. Yeah. So do you have to continue to produce videos for that? Like, is that an ongoing job that you have now because of the app? Yes, it is an ongoing job. Um, you know, I think there's over now there's probably, and because it's different levels, it's beginner level or, you know, more advanced level. And so I think we're up to about 
250 workouts on there now wow. with different combinations of things. So, um, yeah, it's an ongoing process of um, of video and, and some is very structured program. Some is just press play and, you know, I'll lead you through a five-minute quick workout. Um, so, you know, very, very, very different things for different people. And you're not having to do the workouts, are you? Are you doing them? Um, yeah, the I'm videos? doing them, yeah. Oh, you are. So, so not only do you work out twice a day, you're when you shoot these videos, you're doing workouts then too. Yes. Holy yeah. Cow. It's, <laughs> yeah. So it is some are more strenuous than others. And then, um, you know, I, I obviously pulled them together and I, um, needed a sanity check on some of them. So a couple of friends that are sports scientists had a look at it for me as mm -hmm. well. Um, you know, just as a, I guess, a quality assurance check yep. too. Um, and then we, you know, we were doing some of them and we were doing the more advanced level ones. And it was like, oh, my God, this is a full-on workout. So, right. um, you know, there's and there's one that, you know, there's an over 40s specific workout program there too um, because I still think that's a big untapped market around mm -hmm. the world. Um, and the travel one has gone particularly well because it's the idea is, you know, here's one with some workouts that you can do in your hotel room. Super easy. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Um, so, okay. So we got the app and now when you are, you know, like when you're working for Reebok or are they sponsors of the app? Are you like, how, how, how are those relationships and what? Yeah. So they're not sponsors of the app, but they will, um, work with me around, doing some activations that support the app. Okay. Um, so, you know, Reebok most definitely, uh, and I've been with them for a couple of years now. Um, uh, ClassPass I've just recently signed on with across the region. Okay. Um, uh, so we're going to be doing something both with their online platform and, and potentially a, a ClassPass workout on the app as oh, well. Cool. cool. Um, so sort of, you know, sharing audience, um, most definitely. And then, you know, I'm, I'm also tied up with a couple of hotel brands. Um, so I've just been to Thailand and we filmed a, a workout specific, specifically named after that, um, hotel, which is going to hit the app next week oh, too. Cool. So filming them in interesting places and, and different things. So, um, yeah, the, the brands I work with are all fantastic. Um, I just signed on with Polar Watches actually yesterday. So it's a, a nice group of people um, and I'm, you know, loving working with all of them. Do you have different responsibilities for each one? Are you a... Yes. Are, yeah. So are you like a hired... Are you a hired athlete, a hired spokesperson, like a little bit of both? So Reebok is an athlete uh -huh. um, and I guess an influencer. Um, Class Pass is more a spokesperson and a personality uh -huh. for them. Yep. Um, and uh, Polar is, yeah, is athlete slash a bit like a Reebok, um, you know, athlete slash influencer. The hotels are... I'm more of an influencer. And then I'm also an ambassador for Sports Singapore. Wow. Um, so with that, that's more around getting community moving, uh, you know, encouraging people to live a healthy life in the country, um, you know, leading by example, lots of activations. Um, what is, what, if, you, if, if somebody's listening to this podcast and is, is inspired by you and what you've done, especially, well, where, wherever they happen to live, what are some of the things you would tell them to, you know, obviously to get a person to be a personal trainer is one thing, but you're, you're much different than that, really, I see. How would you tell them to proceed? Like, what would you, what advice would you give? Yeah, I think, you know, have a plan, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think, my weakness is definitely trying to be a lot of things at the same time. It's sort of worked out for me, but because it's been a lot of years doing that. Um, but I, I also think you've got to focus on one thing and do that well. And then other things will come as a result 
um, from that. So don't try and be something to everyone um, and be genuine. You know, I think I think there's too many people that are trying to copy someone or look like someone else. It's just, you know, just tell your story and have some some content around it. Is that what you did? Is that how you Yeah, I think so. I think it's just, you know, being who I am and and I'm not I certainly aren't going to appeal to everyone, but that's okay too. So not not everyone loves everyone. Yeah, right. Um so you'll either relate to me or you'll you won't. Um but that's that's fine. What um what is your mission and purpose going forward now from this point? Yeah, I think it's to, you know, to reach more people. Um, you know, I'm excited definitely with the app is to to really try and start building more in people in person communities around fitness. Um, I I think when people get together and work out together, it's a shared experience, um, and there's nothing like it in the world. And it it certainly helps with mental health, um, obviously the physical, and they're they're making new friends and bonding. So I would really love to encourage people to do that and to get outside and do it. I don't think we get outside and and you know, get amongst the environment enough. I think we're stuck in gyms far too often as well. So that's that's definitely something I'm passionate about is green fitness. Is that a thing in Singapore? Is that a big thing in Singapore? Yeah, pe- I mean, people are out because the weather's great. So I mean, it's hot, but people do get out and about. Mm-hmm. You know, but I think it's everyone then defaults to aircon as well because it's so hot. So, you know, I look, the stats are something like there's, you know, with children, there's, it's scary, like 15% of kids exercise outside in the world, that's it. Wow. Yeah, something crazy and it used to be 45. So, Including sports? um, Including doing sports and stuff? Yeah, yeah. So so it's, um, they're just people aren't going outside and and doing things. And I guess, you know, you know, kids that are active and doing sports, but for every one of those, there's probably three sitting at home inside. Yeah, right. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, that's definitely something I'm passionate about is to get people moving and get them moving outside and, and connecting back with the environment. Right. Totally. Um, well, this has been great. I really appreciate, um, everything you're up to. I really appreciate what you're, you know, the stand you've taken in the world for helping people improve their lives and the way you're doing it. You're, I mean, you're just inspiring, just you yourself, just being you. And I think it's really cool that you've been able to capture that online in a way that people can relate, you know, and, and follow you. Thank you. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited that, uh, you know, I've met you and we're launching the whole life challenge as well uh, later, you know, for first kickoff this month. So i um, excited to try and get people moving through that too and bring that to this part of the world. We'll see how that does. And sing. I'm very curious how the... Yeah, we've know, got Australians that, on our team. We're yeah. sort of, you know, we're branching out of Singapore. So uh, so yeah. hopefully, uh, yeah, we have a lot of fun with that. We, we, I know we have people in Australia that play the whole life challenge now, but I've never heard of anybody playing in Singapore. So that'll be a whole new thing. We'll see. Yeah, watch out Asia. Here we come. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't have to leave Singapore. Six million people. I mean, okay, we can, we can, yeah, we, can we can penetrate Singapore. That'd be, that'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> um, what's the best place if people have questions for you or want to engage with you, find you, um, what's the best place to do it? Yeah, so, um, you know, Instagram and Facebook is Rockstar Arms is my handle. And then I have a website, um, which is nataliedow.com. Um, so all the details are on there as well. And Rockstar Fit app. Cool. And I'll put all that stuff in the show notes too, so people can find it. All right. Well, Natalie, thank you so much. Um, You're ready to get on with your day and I'm ready to take my son to soccer practice. I'm ready to eat. (laughs) Oh, right. Right. God, you better hustle. What time time is it there? Is it 10, 9? No, 20 past 9. 20 past 9. Yeah, you're 20 minutes late. (laughs) And uh, I got to get my son off to soccer practice. It's it's evening here. So um, 
There Good, we go. Good, go and exercise outside. See, he's winning already. Totally, totally. That's that's God. That's disturbing. I didn't know. It yeah. Was that, I didn't know it was that bad. All right. Well, um, keep doing it, and I can't wait. We'll we'll talk soon about how things are going with the whole life challenge. In Singapore. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me on. Cool, you're welcome. All right, see ya. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hey, it's Andy, and thanks so much for listening. A few things before you go. These podcasts are for you, so if you have feedback, suggestions, or ideas for people you'd like to hear me interview, please email me at podcast at wholelifechallenge.com. You can find all our past episodes at wholelifechallenge.com forward slash podcast. And to make sure you don't miss a new one, subscribe on iTunes or use an app like Overcast or Apple Podcasts. If you learned something new or were inspired by the conversation today, please consider passing along a link to the episode or to the entire podcast. Better yet, post a link on Facebook or Twitter. By sharing it, you're doing your part to help spread great ideas throughout the world. The Breaking Ordinary podcast is produced by The Whole Life Challenge. Come check out our website and join the next game it might just change your whole life. www.wholelifechallenge.com I'm Andy Petronic. Thanks again for listening.